Hey there! So we know quite a lot already about Data Lake, what feature it has, what files we can use. So let's start to combine this knowledge together to build a Data Lake that has this nice structure that is organized in a proper way to avoid this dreaded thing called Data Swamp. So let's get started. Now, let let me start with revisiting our basic data flow, as I will be referring to it quite a lot during this course. So as you should remember, as a data source, we might have various things, like various types of files, CSVs, parquets, XMLs, JSONs, whatever. Then we usually would have some kind of database, whether it's on the premises or in the cloud. We might some APIs and so on, different types of data sources. So let's just mark all of these as data sources. And what we want to do with them when we start processing? First, we want to dump them, to load them into our storage layer. And we know already that the storage layer has to have some features to be able to store different types of data. And we agreed that in the case of Azure, our service that we uh, would use is simply a data lake or storage account with these hierarchical namespaces enabled that turns them into a data lake. So it's ADLS Gen2. ADLS stands for Azure Data Lake Storage. And what we want to do in the first step is to simply extract this data from various sources and store it inside our data lake. Later on, we would start working with this data, like we would apply some business rules, some cleaning operations. Basically, we would like to transform it. But that's for later. What I would like to start uh, with today is this first step of extraction of our data and store it, storing it somewhere. Now, in the introduction, I mentioned this data swamp thing. So let me talk a little bit about this. So data swamp. We don't want this thing. So that's a bad thing. And basically, our beautiful data lake, it might turn into a data swamp if we don't put uh, enough attention to the way it is organized, it is structured, if we don't care about the governance. So basically, if we allow everyone to dump data to our data lake without any guidance of where this data should land, how it should be structured, we might end up with a case in which no one really knows where data is in a data lake and what state of this data is, what kind of transformations were applied, and whether this uh, data is cleaned, is it uh, raw, is it dirty, can it be used, is it used by anyone. And basically, it might be the case that if you start a new project, when you would need some kind of a data set, you might even find it in your data lake, but just because you don't know if it is still maintained, what is the state of this data, you might probably don't want to use it and you would just import it one more time. So you might end up with multiple copies of the same data set in the same data lake, which is bad. We shouldn't multiply things without any need. So what we want to have is to avoid this data swamp. And to do this, we have to think about the layout of our data lake from the very beginning. So let's, let's talk about the way to accomplish this. So basically, what is done in the case of data lakes is to split it or to split data into multiple layers or zones. So let me write it down. So we want to split it into layers. 
our zones. And each of those zones or layers would just store data in a different state with different types of uh, quality, different types of transformations that were applied on this data. So it would be easier for everyone to know what kind of data is expected in a given uh, layer. And the first layer that I want to talk about today is a row layer. That's the layer to which we'll, ju we'll just import our data, our data sources. And now this row name is the name I like personally. But basically you can find different names that is used for the same type of layer, like staging. You might have called it as landing or bronze. But basically the name doesn't really matter. What matters are the rules that are applied to given layer, given zone. And it is important to let everyone know what is expected from the data in a specific uh, layer. And now our data lake will have multiple zones, multiple layers as we progress with uh, processing uh, this data. But today let's focus only on the first one, on the row layer. So let's talk about what is this layer. What is our row layer? So basically, I would uh, tell that we want to have a one-to-one -one copy of the source data stored in this uh, row layer. And in a second, I will, I will explain why. So it's a one-to-one -one copy of source data. Of source data. And it would be the best if we could just make a binary copy. So it would uh, guarantee that no changes were applied at all to our data. And that's uh, the second very important rule about the data stored in a row layer. We don't want to have any type of transformations applied to it. No, it has to represent data as is. So no transformations, no transformations. And this is very important. Of course, later on, we would use this data and transform it, clean it, apply some business logic, but that's to be done in later stages of our data processing. Right now in a row layer, it is just a one-to-one -one copy. It is obviously immutable so once we loaded and stored our data in this row layer, we can't modify it. If we need to transform it, that's fine. But then let's not update it in place, but let's store the result of our transformations in a different layer. And we'll get back to it later. Now, we want to store this data basically forever. So it is to be retained forever. So again, once the data loads into our row layer, it stays there in an unchanged format basically forever. But because this data most likely to be blunt, it's a crap data. It has a lot of quality issues. Some data might be missing. So we want to limit access to this data. Basically, we want to make sure that no one makes reports based on this data because the results would be basically bad. We will first want to apply some uh, transformations. We want to apply some business rules. So the access to our raw data should be limited. And basically, who should have access to this data? Of course, data engineers who would make this data a little bit better in later phases. 
so data engineers. And also data scientists. They might want to have access. Data scientists. But no end users. No, that's forbidden. Now about the data scientists. Recently I heard quite interesting thing from a data scientist is that with every transformation made to a data, they lose some information. So basically, they prefer to work on a raw data unmodified. So they would know exactly what kind of transformations were done and it would be uh, done by them. And secondly, they should have the skills and knowledge to be able to work with uh, this type of data stored as files on a data lake. So it should be fine to give them uh, access. All right, so this is how this um, data lake should look like in row layer. So now let's think about, but actually why do we need it? Why bother with this additional layer? Because we know that we pay for storage. And if our data is stored forever, then we'll pay for it every day, basically. So the reasons to, to have this uh, layer is as follows. So basically, we want to limit the stress on the source systems. So it means that once we made a connection to the source, to a database that um, sits on the premises, for example, and we queried the data, and we retrieve it, let's just write the results in our data lake, and that's it. Don't query for it again every time we need it, because every query, it uses resources from our source system. It might have negative impact on the OLTP system that basically brings the money to the company. So we want to limit the impact on the source system. So let's write it down limit impact impact on source system and actually i can remember a case in which i was creating a bi solution that was connecting to a on premises all tp database and actually, my query, my BI query, was so greedy for resources that it resulted in timeouts in the OLTP uh, system, which was very bad. And I had to limit my query in a way that it wouldn't be so greedy. And later on, I will show you how it can be done. But basically, that's the reason, one of the main reasons. We want to limit the impact. Secondly, it simplifies our development. So simplify development, development. And again, we as data engineers, it's probably unlikely that the whole processing will be implemented in one step, in one go. No, we'll do it in phases. So we will, we will be rerunning our process multiple times. And we basically don't want to go to the source system and grab the data every time we execute our process when we change a single line. No. Let's store the data in our row layer and let's rerun the processing from this stage. So we don't touch the source system anymore. So it's, it is just faster for us to develop code. Now, the next reason is that if we store all data in our row layer in unchanged format, then in theory, we could rerun the whole process from scratch. Rerun the whole process. And let me explain what I mean by this. And again, let me give you an example from my experience. So once I was creating a BI solution that was using data lake 
and it turned out that business logic that was provided for us was invalid. It had to be changed. And it wasn't possible to just migrate existing data. No, what we had to do was to reprocess all data again using those changed uh, business rules. And the source data was no longer available. But because we had this data stored on a row layer, so we had exactly all data we needed, it was possible to do. So that's yet another advantage of having this row layer. Now, but here, please be aware that rerunning the whole process from scratch, it might not be always possible. And let's say that the business logic changes at some point in time, or the structure of the source data changes at some point in time. So what is usually done is to prepare, let's say, a one-time migration script that is executed on the data we already processed to modify it to the new rules, to the new structure. And then we would just update our processing to work with new data, with new rules. And that's it. So basically, it won't be possible to use this new pipelines with new logic to be executed against the old data because the structure doesn't match, the logic doesn't match. And all right, it might be possible to implement the pipelines or the logic that would take this old data and new data into consideration, but in real life it rarely happens because someone would have to pay for it to maintain those two types of um, data source types, two versions of our business logic. And basically this one type migration script is how it is handled. And now one more reason why we would uh, like to have this row layer are bugs. So let's be realistic, bugs happen. Everyone makes bugs. So it might be the case that uh, you developed a solution, it was delivered to a customer, and one day a business user takes a look at the report and says this value is wrong. And then you have to backtrack the logic through all stages, to, through all uh, phases, to see where this error happened. Maybe it is on, um, in the report itself. Maybe it was made in a transformation phases. So we'll be just going back and back through the transformation uh, steps and you might end up with checking your raw data because maybe you didn't make any mistake. Maybe it was the data that was wrong. And this data might no longer be available in the source system. So if the data itself was wrong, then having this raw layer is a lifesaver because that's the way to check what was actually delivered or received from the source system. And that's very important. And actually, again, I had a case in which I was uh, importing data from a FTP. And this data was removed after two weeks from FTP. There was some automatic script that was just uh, removing all data. So in this case, if we had a bug, then it wouldn't be possible to go to FTP and check the files. No, because they didn't exist there anymore. But because we had this row layer, it would be possible to check what was actually received from uh, FTP. All right, so this was why we want to have this uh, row layer. So now let's talk about how to implement it, how to achieve it. So how? So basically, we know that we are using data like storage accounts. And one of the ways to implement those different types of layers is to use separate containers uh, for each of them. And container is just this top level, let's call it folder. So let me write it down that we might use a row 
container in our data lake. Now, you might think, all right, but maybe I should use a dedicated data lake for each layer, or maybe I should use the same one for all of them. And basically, as always, it depends. So you might use a dedicated data lake, which means that each of those zones would sit on its own data lake. So we would have a row data lake, then some other data lake for the next phase, yet another one, and so on. Or you might want to share them. And now how to decide which one uh, to choose? Well, one of the reasons <clears throat> you might want to split your zones into multiple uh, layers are various limits enforced by Azure on search accounts. So, for example, we can see that a single data lake, single storage account, can have up to 20,000 requests per second. That the ingress, which means how much data we can load to this, um, to this uh, data lake, is like 60 gigabits per second. Quite a lot, to be honest. But maybe if uh, those values are too small in your case, then you might want to split it into multiple data lakes. My advice is to start with a shared one and then spread it if necessary. And please be aware that basically it doesn't really matter from cost point of view whether you store your data in a single data lake or multiple ones, because what you pay for is storage and accesses. And in both cases, you would pay exactly the same, regardless of the way and the data is stored. There might be some additional costs related to networking, but let's put it uh, aside for a moment. So let's say that um, you would use a shared data lake and you would have this raw container. So actually, let's, let's uh, start drawing our hierarchy, how it might look like. So we would start with this row container. So this is our container that indicates our layer, our zone. And this is a container. And then let's think how to organize our data. Because basically, as I said at the beginning, we want to avoid this data swamp thing. So defining a structure or hierarchy is very important. And now there's no single way of doing this. Again, it depends on your case. But what I like to start with is to, let's say, start with a business domain or some kind of area that would logically group our data into some areas. So let's start with business, business domain. Let's call it this way. So in our case, let's say that our business domain is sales. And this is our business domain. Some other examples of domains are manufacturing, HR, finance, whatever, right? It depends on the business. Then inside a business domain, we might later split our data into systems from which given data was extracted. So we would have a source system or database, depends from which uh, system the data is being extracted. So in our case, it might be 
let's say that we ingest data from SAP. So SAP would be our source system. And then we might want to later organize it into data sets. Data sets or tables if we are inside a database. So again, in our case, let's say we want to ingest sales orders. Sales orders. And this would be our data set. So you should already see this hierarchy that uh, should be used for every data that we want to ingest into our row layer. Then what we might want to do is, I would say, optional. It's a load type. So basically, it would tell us, or the uh, data engineers, who later have to uh, process this data, how this data was loaded. I mean, was it a full load? In case of which every time we just receive everything, full set of data, or did we get a delta? Which means that every day, if we are processing, if we are extracting this data on a daily basis, we received only a small portion of the data, which would mean that to get the whole picture, we would have to combine those delta loads from every day. In the case of full loads. Every extract is a kind of a standalone extract because it contains everything. But in case of huge tables, huge data sets, obviously we don't want to um, ingest the whole table every day, especially that probably only a small portion of the data changes from day to day. So let's say that we want to, or that we load our data in an incremental way. So let's create this additional delta directory that indicates the load type. Next, what we might want to do, and this is pretty important, is to partition our data or organize it in a data lake based on ingestion date ingestion date. So date when given data source was extracted and saved to a data lake. And we might split it into different layers, let's call it this way, like here, let's say 2023. Then we would have a uh, month like October. And then we would have directories per specific day, like 15th. And finally, here we would have our data files that we would store. So this is ingestion date. And basically we would follow the same pattern for every type of data we load. So let's say that um, tomorrow we run the processing one more time, we would end up with yet another directory for 16th. That would have its own files that we loaded. Then for 17th and so on and so on. So why do we want to have this kind of hierarchy inside our row layer? So basically two things. First is avoiding this data swamp. So here we can see the clear structure. And if this structure is followed by every um, by every data set that we ingest, then it's pretty easy to find it inside our data lake. And second reason is security. So actually, let me write it down. So security. So uh, let's say that we would like to grant someone access to SAP data. So 
if we have our data organized in these folders that under SAP, we've got only SAP data, then it's pretty easy to grant someone access to this type of uh, data source. The same if you would like to grant someone access to, let's say, sales orders data set only, because we might have multiple data sets ingested from SAP. Again, that's possible. And about this last step of splitting data by ingestion date, not the data, but date. Again, if we know upfront how this data will look like, how it will be organized, it will be very easy for data engineers to implement a pipeline that will grab just, let's say, last day, data from last day, because they, they would know exactly where this data should land. If we change the order of our data, so if we use this date at the very top, instead of, let's say, source system, then granting someone access to SAP data only, it wouldn't be possible. So basically that's how you want to organize your data. All right, so we know how the directory hierarchy should look like. But now let's think about the file format that we would like to use. Because uh, we know that at the end, our data is stored in a data lake as files. And we discussed various types of file formats. We know which ones have what kind of features. So let's think about which format would be the best in the case of raw layer. And you might think that let's go with Delta because Delta is the ultimate format. True, it is. But actually, in case of raw layer, what I prefer to have is to use a native format, not data, not delta one. Native. So by native, I mean the original format. So let's say if we ingested a CSV data, a CSV file, let's store it as a CSV on our raw layer. If we ingest at, I don't know, XML, let's store it as an XML. So we want to keep the same file format that was originally present at the source. And you might say, why? Again, because we want to avoid making any types of transformations to our data and changing a format in which data is saved if done incorrectly, it might already transform our data. Let's think about CSV. That's the most obvious example. If you make a mistake and if you incorrectly define those text qualifiers, the limiters, it might mean that you would parse the CSV file in an incorrect way and you would save this incorrect data as a raw data. So we are already introducing a bug to your, to your system. And later on, it might be very difficult for you to find out how the original CSV looked like. So that's uh, why I want to stick with the native format. And this is quite easy in the case of a file-based systems. So if we uh, grab a file of given type, let's just save it using the same type. All right, but what in case of, let's say, databases? How to save them? Because we can't save data from database as a database in case inside of our row layer. So here I would go with one of file types that allow us to preserve the structure, the schema of our data. Because you know that every table in a database has a schema defined. What columns it has, what data types, nullability, this type of data. And if we just store it as a CSV, we would lose this information. And that would be bad, because if you have already the schema, let's preserve it. 
and you should remember that there are two file types that we covered so far that contain the schema as a part of a file. It's Parker and Delta. Delta uses Parker under the hood. And now it's up to you whether you want to use Parker or Delta. Both would work just fine. My preference, I would say, is to go with Parker. At this moment, it might be easier to use Parker. And secondly, we might not need those additional features of Delta inside our row layer. Do we need transactional support? Hmm. If the process would fail, we would just rerun it. And the new process would just remove the old data and load it one more time. So Parker should work just fine. But if you could use Delta, then go with Delta. Now, one thing that you should be aware of is the amount of data. If your data extracts are huge, you should um, pay attention to compression. You should remember that Parker and Delta, they compress data quite nicely, while CSVs or XMLs, they don't. So if the data volume is a very important aspect in your case, then you might want to switch to Parquet or Delta for all file types, for all file, for all data sources. But it's again up to you. Now, the next thing we should define inside our row layer is lifecycle management policy. Lifecycle management policy. And again, those policies are used just to switch access tier used uh, for specific files. And in the case of raw data, they might uh, use a lot of disk space. And we want to limit our costs and probably after some time this data stored in a row layer won't be used that often so you might want to move them to archive access tier and lifecycle management policy is a great uh, way to accomplish this so make sure to to define it uh, based on your requirements now there's one more thing I would like to talk about is watch out for PII data. And by PII, PII data, I mean those sensitive data that uh, can be used to identify a given person. PII stands for personally identifiable information, like first name, last name, email address, this type of data. So it might be the case that in your source data, you would receive this PII data. And there might be some law regulations that tell you how this type of data has to be processed or audited. What can be done with this data? Can you process it at all? So just pay attention uh, to it. And when in doubt, consult your legal team what you can do with the data. Maybe you need a consent from, from someone to, to be able to process his data. Let's say that you've got this sales, uh, sales order data set. And one of the fields that is stored there is a first name and last name of a person who made this order. And maybe law forbids you from processing this, this type of data. So again, contact law, your legal team. And basically, it's again a question to, to business guys that provide you with requirements. Is it really important to know who made the order, that it was Piotr who made this specific order? Or, or maybe what is important is the possibility to combine all the orders made by a specific person. 
But without the actual knowledge, who was that person? Maybe that's all they need. So in this case, you might uh, anonymize this data. You might hash this first name, last name, and use some kind of identifiers and use it instead of uh, real values. So again, that's something that you should take into consideration. Anonymize. So that's something you might want to uh, have. To, you might you might have to do. Now, so far, I was talking, I was presenting this uh, row layer in a way that we would have a single data lake that stores all data in a single place. But it might be the case that actually, from various security reasons or networking reasons, you might want to split it into multiple ones. And let me explain it, what I mean. So let's uh, think about security and networking. All right. So basically, when we think about the way we receive the data, we might define two types of this process. Either it is a push approach or pull. Pull is a case when it is our software which connects to some database, to some FTP, to some API, and grabs the data and brings it to our data lake. And that's, I would say, the most common case. But we might also have a push scenario in which it is the other party, the data provider, that connects to our data lake and uploads the data to it. Which would mean that it would need some kind of access, when it, um, whether we talk about networking and opening a firewall to its IPs, or giving him um, some principle that it could use to connect. And it might be the case that actually your company policy might say that it is absolutely forbidden for some other party to connect to our data lake and upload data there because it's a security incident that just just that is just not acceptable. So in such case, what you might have to do is to create small, let's call them landing data lakes for specific data providers. So let's say this is our landing data lake. This is our data provider. Of course, the, there is some kind of a firewall in front of our data lake. And this data provider would be allowed to connect to this dedicated landing data lake and upload its file there. And we might have different or multiple landing ADLS for, um, for different data providers. ADLS Gen 2, again, it would have some its own data provider, we would have a firewall and data would be allowed to flow in this way. Now, apart from this data, we might have a regular data sources like some kind of APIs or databases from which we pull our data. So let's draw our main data lake. So let's say this is our data lake. And let's say that it has this row container as one of its layers. And then we would simply connect to various data sources 
to API to a database and to those small lending um, data lakes as well. And obviously you would have a firewall here as well. And the traffic would be allowed. So what did we do here actually? So here we would have a pull approach, right? So it would be us connecting to some external data sources. In this case, those landing ADLS, it would be considered external from our main data lake point of view. But because it is us who make the connection, it should be allowed. Here we would have this push approach. So those data providers, they would push data, but not to our main data lake, but to their own dedicated uh, landing data lakes. And again, from security point of view, it should be fine because even if something bad happens, this data provider wouldn't have access to our main data lake. So it wouldn't see any data that is different from his own data he uploaded. So it should be secure. And basically, uh, that's it for today. So let's summarize it. So we want to avoid a mess in our data lake. And the way to do, it, to do this is to think about a way to organize our data from the very beginning. And basically it is done by splitting our data lake into multiple zones or layers, each of which has a set of rules that define how the data looks like inside given uh, zone. And the first layer we use to store data ingested from the source is called, in my case, row. That stores data that is unprocessed, not transformed, so basically we want to use the native format. It is stored forever. It is stored in a way that makes finding this data quite easy and applying security as well quite easy. And this row layer will be later used as a foundation to build additional layers with some more transformations applied. So that's it for today. I hope you like it. Thanks and see you next time. Take care.